Brown, Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Carter Brown to introduce another one of my books for you. This story is called The Lady Was Lethal, as my hero, Johnny Eaton, found out. And in finding that out, he also found quite a lot of tension and trouble, which is my cue to quit and let Eaton carry on. hated the place. The business had taken me there more than once. Now it had taken me there again. It was large, high, and cold. But then, death is always cold. I hated the hollow ring your steps made on the floor, and the way your voice ricocheted off the walls. The shape which lay shrouded on the table drew my eyes. And there was a dry sensation at the back of my throat as Lieutenant Jorgensen flipped the sheet away. There he is. Yeah. That's Hank Williams, all right. That's all you got to say? What do you want me to say? Happy birthday? He was your partner, wasn't he? He was my partner. You're a tough guy, aren't you? Johnny Eaton, the man with the poker face. I show you your partner's body and you react like it was a guy you'd never seen before. You want me to bust out crying? What good would that do, Hank? You guys have been in partnership for the last five years. Always acted like you were the best of pals. You were away in Detroit for three weeks on a job. You come back, I tell you Williams is dead. So? So I'm wondering, Johnny. Wondering whether you're really tough or just plain scared. What's that crack supposed to mean? Let's get out of here and I'll tell you. Well? I'm wondering how much you know about why Williams was knocked out. Maybe you're acting like a clam because you figure you'll stay alive that way. You think I'd be wasting my time, Lieutenant, listening to your yak at a yak if I knew who killed Hank? Could be. I'll have to keep an eye on you, Johnny. After all... We don't want to lose the other half of the best private eye partnership in town, do we? No, we don't. That's your jalopy? Uh-huh. New model Buick. Business must be looking up. We get by. I guess I should say I get by. Williams didn't have any family. A sister in Kentucky someplace. She'll have to be told. What happens to his share of the business? I get it. His sister gets the rest. The dough in the bank, etc. You should do all right out of the business. We both made a will. Whoever went first left his share of the business to the other. And by good luck, Williams went first. Jorgensen, there are times when I dislike you more than normally. This is one of those times. <laughs> As I drove back to the office, the night sky was studded with star points, but their silver twinkle was rivaled by the gleam of garish neon stabbing above the streets. I let myself into the office, started going through Hank's desk, but I knew it was a forlorn hope. There was one thing I hadn't told Lieutenant Jorgensen. I'd come back from Detroit in answer to an urgent wire from Hank. It said he'd cracked something really big and needed my help. The trouble was that Hank was the sort of private dick who never kept notes. He kept everything inside his skull. And that skull was now silent. I was right. There was no hint of what Hank had got onto. And there was so much of him in the office... 
I had to get out. I needed a drink. It was a hunky-tonk. I wasn't feeling like the black tie nightclubs. This dive had a sign outside which spelled the world's most beautiful girls. Inside, the world's most beautiful girls were dancing with sailors, small-time hoods, and suckers. They all looked bored, and most of them chewed gum while they danced. Romantic. Your drink, bud. Thanks. Hey, you look kind of gloomy, kiddo. Why don't you cheer up and have a dance? Fifty cents a ticket. Go away. Oh, you don't have to be rude. If you don't want to have any fun, well, okay, Go but... splash in the sea. Oh, now look, there ain't no call to be... Beat it, babe. What? I said beat it. Oh, well, okay, okay. There's no need to get tough about it. Dames. Mind if I park? Suit yourself. If you can find a glass, you can even have a drink. No, thanks. Cigar? No, thanks. You're Johnny Eaton, that right? Yeah. I was looking for you. So, now you've found me. How much do you want? For what? You know what. How much? I don't know what you're talking about. Quit stalling, Seamus. Name a price. Look, let's play a little game. Let's pretend I really don't know what you're talking about. So you tell me, and then if I've got it and it's for sale, I'll name a price. Okay. I'm talking about the thing your partner, Hank Williams, had. He didn't have it this afternoon, and it wasn't in your office. So he either sent it to you, or he parked it someplace and told you where. Now, put a tag on it, Buster. I ain't got all night. You mean Hank was murdered for this thing, but you couldn't find it? Sure. Why, you Don't dirty... Don't start anything. You can't finish, Buster. I've got company. That little punk propping up the jukebox? Plenty of good guys have been perforated by a punk. That's a point. So, how much? $40,000. That's a lot of dough. Maybe it'd be cheaper to have happen to you what happened to your partner. Will that get you what you're looking for? Maybe we might sort of persuade you to tell where it is first. Maybe. 40000 is the price. I'll have to find out. Could take a little time. See you tomorrow and tell you. Be in your office. I'll be there. Okay, Seamus. Don't do anything foolish, will you? Not like Williams did. I watched him clamp the cigar in his teeth, signal to the thin little guy, and the two of them walked out. Just then the blonde who'd tried to sell me a dance moved past the table. I called her. Yeah? What do you want, mister? I've changed my mind. I'll buy some tickets. How many? Ten bucks worth. Oh, what a boy. Now you're getting hit. Sit down. Have a drink. Sure. Hey, buddy, another glass. Here, Blondie. The ten dollars. Oh, thanks. Here's your tickets. Keep them. What's the big idea? You've got the ten bucks and the tickets. So you've just made a ten dollar profit, right? Yeah, but... A glass. Thanks. Remind me to endorse your Emily Post diploma sometime. Here. Give your stomach a shock. Oh, thanks. Now, that ten bucks you just made, that's for information. Oh, what do you want to know, honey? The big guy who said scram and you scrammed, who is he? Mister, I think I'd better give you back your ten bucks. You sound like trouble to me. No, not trouble. I'm just curious. I've been out of town. I don't know anymore who runs with who. Oh, well, he's Tiny Laban. I don't know who he works for, but he hangs out in the blues club. Yeah, that's what the name says, all blues and stuff. Who was the other guy with him? Oh, he was on his own. No, it was a little pasty-faced guy by the jukebox. Oh, that's Babyface Brill. He's a mean character. Well, mister, that get me ten dollars? Sure does, and thanks. I'm sure you wouldn't like to dance. I'll give you a dance for free. Some other time. i got to be moving. You know, business... If business means trouble with Tiny Laban, you won't tell him who told you. Over my dead body. With Tiny Laban, that could be easy. The Blues Club. A high-class dive. Cloths on the tables. No taxi dancers. A floor show. Six girls were just finishing a routine as I sat down and ordered a drink. They wobbled off the floor and the lights dimmed down to a single spot as a compare breathed one word into the mic. 
Chilly. I thought he was talking about the weather until a dame appeared in the spot. And what a dame. A tall brunette with a figure dreamed up by a perfectionist and then improved on. Your eyes are blue, your kisses too. I never knew what they could do. Can't believe that you're in love with me. I listened to her low, husky voice and started to remember things like that Hank was like me. He could be a sucker for a dame. And if Tiny Laven was tied in with this place, and Hank had something Laven wanted, then it wasn't impossible that Hank had met Chelly. As I watched her, I decided it was more than probable that Hank knew her. Chelly was the last thing a guy would feel next to Chelly. And Hank liked to keep warm more than most guys. I called the waiter. Yes, sir. I'd like to talk to Chile. Sir, you stand at the end of a long line of gentlemen with the same ambition. There's a five spot going begging for someone to take it with the message to the lady. What message, sir? That I'd like to talk to her about my partner, a guy named Hank Williams. I'll deliver your message, sir. I never saw a five-dollar bill disappear faster from a table and into a pocket. I poured myself another drink, but I'd only had one sip when he was back with his eyebrows touching his hairline. Chile will see you. Don't look so surprised. I'm a guy who makes friends and has influence. The waiter led the way. And as I followed, I was congratulating myself. It looked like I had lighted on a lead at last. Carter Brown, Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown. person in the private eye profession runs the risk of sudden death. But the death of Hank Williams, my pal and partner in the firm of Williams and Eaton, came as a double shock. Because Hank had wired me that he was onto something big. And when I got back, it was too late to ask him what it was. Also, Hank was a guy who never put anything on paper. So I had nothing to give me a lead. But I found that it involved a muscular male named Tiny Laven and a mean mobster called Babyface Brill. It also seemed to involve the singer at the blues club, a girl named Chili, who was anything but. You're the man who sent the waiter with a message? That's right. You wanted to talk to me about Hank Williams? Yes, he was my partner. I'm Johnny Eaton. Glad to know you, Johnny. I'm even gladder to know you. Oh, why? Look in your mirror for a couple of good reasons. <laughs> Chili, you knew Hank, didn't you? Uh-huh. When did you last see him? Oh, two, maybe three days ago. I'm not sure. Why? Nothing's happened to him, has it? Only one thing. He's dead. No. Oh, that's not true. It can't be. I'm afraid it can, and it is. This afternoon. Poor Hank. He wouldn't listen to me. I told him it was dangerous. What was? Oh, whatever he was doing. He kept telling me he was onto something big, that he was saving it for his partner, but I knew it was dangerous by the way he talked. Dangerous enough to kill him. Do you know a guy named Laven, Tiny Laven? I've heard the name somewhere. Comes into this club, they tell me. Big guy, smokes cigars. I think I know who you mean. What about him? I think he had something to do with it, that's all. I liked Hank. He was a nice guy. Anything I can do to help Johnny, I'll do. Thanks. Come in. Julie, I heard that... Oh, 
Sorry, I thought you were on your own. Oh, it's okay. This is Johnny Eaton. He's Hank Williams' partner. You remember Hank? Sure, the private dick. This is Hal Waltham, Johnny. He owns the Blues Club, which means he employs me. That makes you a lucky guy, Waltham. And I know it. How's Hank? They're looking after him very well down at the morgue. You're joking. No, Hal. He was killed this afternoon. Well, of all the tough breaks... I was telling Johnny that anything I can do to help, I'll be only too glad. But Hank never talked about his work. No. Well, same thing goes for me, Eden. Anything I can do, anything at all. Nice of you, Waltham. If there is anything, I'll look you both up. Particularly Chili. What she's got is worth looking at. I picked up a cab from outside the Blues Club and gave him the address of my apartment. When I put the key in the lock and opened the door, there was a light coming from the living room. Automatically, I reached for my gun. Then I remembered I wasn't carrying it. I moved into the living room and got a surprise. A beautiful, blonde surprise with tear-filled eyes. Oh, I'm sorry, but I didn't know when you'd be back, and I just had to see you. Well, how flattering can a blonde be? You are Johnny Eaton, aren't you? Unless I've changed in the last ten minutes. The superintendent of the building let me in here. I'm Helen Williams. Hank's sister. But you're in Kentucky. I, I wired you about Hank. That's why I came up. Got in an hour ago. The caretaker at Hank's apartment house sent me to the police. I saw a Lieutenant Jorgensen. He told me what had happened. And then I came here. Well, it's tough, Helen. I, I know uh, Hank was a great guy. Yes. Yes, he was. Uh, you go ahead, honey. If you want to cry, it won't worry me any. You could weep a few tears for me, too. No, no, I mustn't. Could I... Could I have a drink? Sure, sure. We'll both have one. What'll you do now, Helen? Go back to Kentucky? No, not until Hank's murderer is behind bars. I'm staying until he's caught. Your drink. That might take a long time. I don't care. Where are you going to stay tonight? I hadn't thought about it. I couldn't go back to Hank's apartment. Not now. Maybe I could find a hotel. Not at this time of night. Tell you what, you stay here. I'll take the sofa. You can have my room. In the morning, we'll find you an appointment. Oh, thanks, Johnny. Thanks a million. Don't look at me with those trusting eyes. Why not? Because I don't know that I'm too trustworthy. Not with a bewitching blonde. Well, I trust you, Johnny. And since I'm going to stay, I might as well be useful. Anyone as decorative as you doesn't have to worry about being useful. Well, I'm going to be. You'll need someone in the office now that Hank won't be there. I'll be your secretary. That's fine. Anything that keeps you close by suits me. Jerk your mind off my gender and think about justice. For Hank's killer. Okay, Helen, you're right. I better give you the story so far. The next morning, while Helen was out arranging for Hank's funeral and then seeing about an apartment, I sat in my office waiting for the promised visit from Tiny Laven and Babyface Brill. My desk drawer was open... And the gun in it had the safety catch off. You're here, huh, Seamus? I said I would be, Mr. Levin. That's smart of you, Eaton. Real smart. Thanks. A compliment from Babyface Brill is really something. You know our names, huh? I get around. Hmm. Well, here it is, Seamus. Forty thousand dollars is too high. Twenty-five grand is the most the boss will pay. And who is the boss? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> okay. Sorry, Levin, the price stays where it is. Otherwise, it's no sale. You don't want to talk like that, Eden. No. You might wake up dead. Bumping me off still doesn't get you what you want. You won't find out where the stuff is from a corpse. Like I said before, we might be able to persuade you to tell us before you kick off. You know what the recipe for fried chicken says. First, catch your bird. You won't be hard to take. Why don't we do it now? I get tired of listening to its voice. Just try it, baby face. Me and this 38 are waiting. All ready for us, are you? Your partner Williams figured he was tough, too. We'll give you 24 hours to change your mind, Eaton. After that... Don't slam the door on your way out, boys. You fresh punk! Calm down, babyface. You'll have plenty of time to devote to Mr. Eaton 24 hours from now. If he doesn't wise up. Yeah. Take a tip, Eaton. 
Change your mind. Otherwise, I'll have fun changing your face. Johnny Eaton. Johnny, it's Chili. Not with your voice warming up the wire. I've been thinking about what you were telling me last night. I might be able to help a little. That's fine. Could you come over and see me? Sure, let's see. It's just on 6 o'clock now. I won't be through at the club until nearly midnight. And I don't think it would be a good idea for you to come there. My apartment would be better. Much better. Just you and me and a bottle makes three. The address is apartment 16, 248 Parkview. Great. See you at midnight. <laughs> Midnight is the witching hour, they say. And chilly at midnight was one wow of a witch. We sat side by side on the sectional sofa with the drinks handy. And I told Chili all about Tiny Laven. You have no idea what this thing is that Laven wants? No, like I keep saying to people, Hank wasn't a guy to make notes. He carried it all in his head. I pulled the gag that I'd got it on Laven just to see the reaction. I don't suppose you'd believe me if I told him the truth. Probably not. And according to Laven, they searched the office and they must have searched Hank's apartment and they didn't find it. So what did Hank do with it? Whatever it is. You got me. I can't even begin to guess. I think I might be able to help you, Johnny. But you'd have to trust me. That's a song I've heard before. I lied a little last night. I know Laven quite well. And the other one, Babyface Brill. But I wasn't sure last night whose side you were on. Go on. I could help you, but you mustn't ask questions. Oh, I mustn't, huh? I like you, Johnny. I want to help you, but I can't help liking you as well, can I? It's the fatal Eaton charm. And every time a dame tells me it's working, I find I've lost my wallet later on. You're a cynical character. I've been around a long time. But not around me. Still cynical, Johnny? I'm not sure how you describe the feeling, but I don't think cynical is the word. <laughs> uh, you were going to tell me about Laven. He and Brill are a couple of strong arm men. I didn't think they were chartered accountants. They're tied in with the Blues Club. Huh? It oh. really is a club, but its membership is secret. So that's what Hank was on to. I guess so. I thought it was just me. Who runs the place? Hal Waltham is the manager, but he's only paid. I don't know who really owns it. Laven gives the orders. Maybe Hank had some proof. Maybe that's why they murdered him. To stop him turning it over to the cops. That'd be your age, Johnny. A joint the size of the blues doesn't exist without protection, which includes protection from the cops. Hank must have had something more than that. Anyway, why did he get so interested? Why would he stick his nose into a tough setup like the blues? Ah, oh, that's right. Ah, sometimes I'm so dumb I can hardly believe it myself. Of course he had a client. Sure. So find his client. And you might get some idea of what he had that they want so badly. Yeah, it's a bright thought. The only thing is, is, how do I find him? You should know. You're the detective. Who could that be at this hour? Well, it's not opportunity. That only knocks once. Well, I guess I'd better go and find out. As she walked out of the room, I thought that with things as they were, I'd be happier, safe than sorry. So I eased the gun out of my shoulder holster and stood behind the door so that I was hidden from anyone coming into the room. What? What's the idea? Inside Chile, like a good kid. Sorry about this, but it's nothing personal. Just orders. Who's orders? Just orders. I'll give it to you nice and quick. You won't know a thing about it, honest. Like you gave it to Hank Williams? I wouldn't know anything about that. But I can't stand here yabbering. And it won't do your nerves any good either. So long, Chili. Nothing personal, you understand? Sure, she understands. What? <laughs> oh, Johnny, am I glad you were here. Oh, I believe you're as tough as they say. Babyface doesn't seem to like you. Brill neither likes nor dislikes anybody. It's just a job as far as he's concerned. A job he's paid to do. The interesting thing is, who's paid him to rub you out? I don't know. Well... Whoever it is, it's a sign they're getting scared, which means they might make a mistake. And when they do, I'll be right there. Carter Brown, Mysteries. 
Adventures in Excitement and Suspense, based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown. I was working in the dark and I wished someone would turn on some light. With the firm of Williams and Eaton deprived of the services of Hank Williams by sudden death, it left me, Mrs. Eaton's little boy Johnny, carrying the ball. The only drawback was that I didn't know what the ball was supposed to look like or where I was supposed to boot it. Well, what did you do with this babyface, Brill, after you knocked him out? Hal Waltham, the Blues Club manager, came over and I gave babyface to him. What does it all mean, Johnny? Helen, I wish I knew. It certainly looks like it's all tied in with Hank's murder. That is for sure. Your brother had something or knew something. Why the heck the dumb ox always insisted on playing his cards close to his chest, I'll never know. If only he'd left a note, some hint. Even if he had, you'd still never have found it. That Laban man would have got it first. Yeah, I guess so. How's the apartment, Helen? Oh, it's all right, Johnny. I'm afraid I can't take much interest in anything till Hank's killer is... Yeah, I know, honey. I know. Now, who's that, I wonder? I can tell you. It's a man named Stokes. He called up this morning and wanted to see you. I told him you'd be in the office about this time. Okay, Helen. Let him in. Huh? All right, Johnny. Uh, Mr. Eaton. Oh, yes, sir. He's in the small office there. Won't you go in? Oh, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Eaton. My name is Stokes. Good morning. Shut the office door. We'll be nice and private. You wanted to see me? What can I do for you, Mr. Stokes? I read about your partner's death. A terrible business. His sister and I agree with you. I have his murder on my conscience, Mr. Eaton. You see, I am the man responsible. You mean you... Oh, no. I don't mean I'm the man who pulled the trigger, though I might just as well have done so. I'm the man who hired your partner for the investigation that led to his death. The client? Hank's client. Yes. I hired Mr. Williams to investigate the Blues Club and give me proof of the bribery and corruption which came from it. Can I ask why, Mr. Stokes? I'm a rich man, Mr. Eaton. I had a daughter. She went to the Blues Club a few times. I suppose she thought it was exciting that they knew her, knew where she came from, knew that there was money behind her. Go on, Mr. Stokes. You know the story, Mr. Eaton. It's an old story. Not even a very exciting story, except to the people directly concerned. She spent her allowance, she sold her jewelry, her clothes, she stole things from the house. And then finally she couldn't stand it any longer. I'm sorry. I can understand how you feel. I think perhaps you can, Mr. Eaton. I know how your partner felt about you, and I imagine you felt the same way about him. I wanted him to get me proof of the Blues Club's activities, and proof that it was allowed to exist by a number of people holding positions of public trust. And I think he had it. Yeah, I've got reason to think that too. The morning of the day he was killed, he called me. Said he had something really big, and that he was sending you an urgent wire to come back and help him with it. The next thing I knew was the notice of his death in the papers. You're going to ask me if I have that proof, Mr. Stokes. I haven't. But I know the people concerned haven't got it either. He hid it somewhere. We don't know just where, but it must turn up sooner or later. I can only pray that it does, Mr. Eaton. I came here this morning to ask you to take over where Mr. Williams left off. Well, I'm doing that in any case. Of course. But I should like you to consider this check as bringing the retainer up to date. Two thousand dollars? That's a lot of hay. I told you, my feed bag is well filled. Here's my card. You can reach me at that phone number or address... Right, Mr. Stokes. I'll keep you informed. You may believe me, Miss Reeton, when I say that once I get my hands on whatever Williams unearthed, I shall know the best quarters in which to make use of it. Good morning, Mr. Reeton, and good luck. Goodbye, young lady. Goodbye, sir. Well, who was he, Johnny? He was your brother's client. Johnny? Then you know what it's all about? I've got an idea, and tonight I'm going to make sure. Tonight, I'm paying the Blues Club another visit. I got there early. 
The club was only half full. The waiters were looking bored, and after a couple of drinks, I donned the dull expression, too. I folded a couple of five spots in half, held them prominently in my hand, and signaled the guy who'd served me. Same again, sir? No. This is a bit slow. I'd like to go upstairs. Upstairs, sir? Don't kid me. A pal of mine told me all about this joint. I want some fun. How about it? I'll inquire, sir. If you'll just wait. I waited, with my fingers crossed and my eye on the entrance in case the hefty hunk that was Tiny Laven showed up. Then the waiter was back. If you'll follow me, sir. Sure. We went past the band to a doorway next to the kitchen. And up a narrow staircase. To an iron door at the top. The waiter rapped on the door. Yeah? A new member. Okay. Come on in. A uh, new member, huh? What's the name? Hyde. Jico Hyde. Cost you $50 entrance fee, Mr. Hyde. Sure. Okay, you're in. Through that door. Help yourself. It was a large room, well supplied with gambling tables. It was also well supplied with babes. One of them, a red-headed, swivel-hipped model with the latest type chassis, swayed over. Hello there. You're a new member? That's right. I'm Anna. Nice to know you. I go for a girl with your manner, Anna. Would you like to play? That's what I came for. What can you offer? There's a roulette, baccarat, shimmy, or dice. Dice is strictly for the proletarians. I think I'll have a whirl at the wheel. champagne, honey? No. Like the man in the song, I get no kick from champagne. Try one of the other tables. What for? I dropped 400 bucks on the roulette. What makes you think I'll be any luckier at the others? Say, you're really down, aren't you, sugar? Right down. Down where you can't get no downer. I want something exciting, something new, something with a real lift in it. Maybe I could do something about that. Come with me. In here. Give me $200 and I'll get it for you. Okay. Just wait here. I lit a cigarette and waited. I thought I was getting closer. Closer to finding out what Hank had found out. Then I remembered he'd got killed for it. Here you are, honey. Just two pellets? Comes high, doesn't it? hundred bucks a pellet. That's the real thing. You ought to be grateful. I am, baby. And I'm going to demonstrate my gratitude to you. You are, sugar? How? Like this. Oh! Sorry, Anna, but it's time I was going. And I wouldn't want you to stop me. I got past the gorilla at the iron door with no trouble and walked through the club with my gun in my pocket and my fingers curled around the butt. Half an hour later, I was in my apartment and the two little white pellets were safely stowed away. Whether they'd make evidence or not, I wasn't sure. I thought I'd ask Lieutenant Jorgensen sometime. But at last, I knew exactly what went on at the Blues Club. Good morning, Johnny. Do you always get into the office this early? Sure, Helen, when I'm breaking in a new secretary. You can't call me new. I've been working here for three days now. 
Did you get anywhere at the Blues Club last night? Yep, I got into their private rooms. And you found out? A few interesting items. Well, here's another interesting item. This letter and package arrived here. Uh Uh-huh. Addressed to you in Kentucky and forwarded on. Yes. The day after I came here, I wired back leaving your office as my forwarding address. Here, read the letter first. Uh, But that's Hank's handwriting. Dear Helen... This is terribly urgent, or I wouldn't be bothering you. Enclosed is a package that is vitally important. Please put it in your safe deposit till I send for it. Johnny Eaton is on his way back from Detroit, so I can't send it to him, and I daren't carry it around with me. When I get some time, I'll tell you all about it. When are you coming over for that... holiday? Rob, Hank. When am I coming over for that holiday? No, take it easy now, sweetheart. See, let's take a look at that package. It's a notebook. Hey. What is it? Wait a minute. Well, I'll be... Wow. What is it? It's dynamite. It's loaded. No wonder they wouldn't stop at murder to try and get it back. But what is it? Well, without looking at it from beginning to end, it looks like a record of payments, a record of bribery and corruption, of people they've paid to keep their mouths shut. City Hall, state politics, the police, and the narcotics squad. Narcotics? Yeah, that's one of the items I found out last night. The blues club's a front for dope peddling. Honey, this little book will lift the roof off the city if it ever hits the press. It'll smash prominent people people in positions of trust, respectable people. Say, you don't believe it until you see it. And now we've got it. Johnny Eaton, what are you thinking? I'm thinking of using this little book as bait. We might hook quite a lot of fish. Isn't that dangerous? Sure. It was dangerous for Hank. I owe them something for that. And this is paying off time. Carter Brown, Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense. Based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation... Carter Brown. The light had broken. The motive for the murder of my partner, Hank Williams, was clear, contained in the notebook he'd sent his sister and which now lay on the desk between us in my office. I stared at the notebook, and my thoughts turned to the past to when Hank Williams and Johnny Eaton were a team, a first-rate private detective team. And now there was only Eaton left. Well, they were going to pay for it. What are you planning to do, Johnny? Listen, and you'll find out. Who are you calling? The Blues Club. This is where the hook gets baited. Blues Club. I want to talk to Mr. Layden. Who's calling? Tell him Johnny Eaton. He'll talk to me. Hold on. You're late calling to tell me you've changed your mind, Seamus. The 24 hours I gave you is over. That's not what I'm calling for, Levin. So, what do you want? Just to tell you that I've definitely got the goods you want. All done up in a neat little book. Yeah? 40000 is the firm price. You've got till tomorrow morning. Otherwise, it goes to Washington, and they can sort it out on a federal level. So make up your mind fast, won't you? Now, listen. Goodbye, Levin. Oh, Johnny, was that smart? They'll be after your blood. And I'm after theirs. Where do we go from here? To my apartment. I feel safer when we're both there. The only way in is through the front door. The windows look out on a sheer drop of seven floors, and the fire people are always complaining because we've got no fire escapes. So long as we watch the door, we're set. Once we got to the apartment, Helen headed for the kitchen to rustle up coffee. I set about a little work. I found a piece of oil silk, carefully wrapped the notebook and my gun in it, and tied a piece of wire around it. I went downstairs to my car, took off the petrol filler cap, and carefully slid the package into the petrol tank, attaching the wire to the screw thread on the cap. It was as good a hiding place as I could think of. Johnny? 
Yeah, it's me, honey. Coffee's ready. Here you are. Ah, thanks, honey. Say, what have you done to yourself suddenly? Nothing. Why? Oh, I don't know. You, you look a different girl somehow. <laughs> I'm the same girl. Only now you're beginning to notice me. Johnny. Okay, I'll go. Who is it? Me, Jorgensen. What's the matter with you? Nothing. Come in, Lieutenant. Thanks. Who is it, Johnny? Lieutenant Jorgensen. Pour him a cup of coffee. Let's go in the living room, Lieutenant. Okay, but I haven't got time for coffee. You know Helen Williams, Lieutenant. <laughs> Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Miss Williams. Sure you want to have coffee? No, thanks. You don't look happy, Sleuth. What's your trouble? You know a dame called Chili? Real name Elsie Kuchenheimer? I know Chili. I never met Elsie. You never will. Now. Someone shot her about an hour back. Three times. That's tough. But why tell me? Because I'm going to take you in, Johnny. Captain's orders. Take me in for what? To be held as a material witness. You're kidding, Jurgensen. No, this is on the level. The captain wants to talk to you. We'll see about that. I'm calling my lawyer. No, Johnny. Why the artillery, Jorgensen? The captain wants to talk to you without any lawyers. You carrying a gun? If you are, you better let me have it. I'm not healed. Okay, then let's go. Helena won't be long. Remember what I told you about the door? All right, Johnny. Come on, come on, let's move. Things must be getting tough in the police department, Lieutenant. Why? Can't afford any squad cars to make a pinch. Just you in an ordinary auto. No other cops. The captain wants it done the quiet way. Hey, this isn't the road to the precinct. The captain's over 23rd. Oh. What's the idea? What are you stopping for? The book, Johnny. I want it. Oh. Because one of the names in it is yours, Jurgens? Because one of the names in it is mine. I've been 15 years on the force, Johnny. I'm not letting anybody take that away from me. Well, what do you know? A crooked cop worrying about his good name. You got a choice, Johnny. You can give me the book, I'll burn it and forget we ever talked about it. Or you can stay clammed up and I'll turn you over to the others. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, I gave you a chance. Now I'm going to give you something else. No! <laughs> Coming too. I'm glad. I wouldn't want that sock you gave him to kill him, Jorgensen. I just tapped him. Shut up, all of you. He's conscious. Yeah, I'm conscious. And I wish I weren't. Looking at a prized collection of rats is not my idea of entertainment. Waltham, Laven, Babyface, and Jorgensen. What a quartet. All right, Eden, you've said your piece. Now there's only one thing for you to add. The whereabouts of the book. He's definitely got it because he knew my name was in it. Why that dumb dame ever had to keep a book? She had to keep one, or everyone else would have thought she was shortchanging us. Where Chili was dumb was that she could never resist a good-looking guy. So when Williams came along and made like he knew everything, she started confiding in him. After him, Eaton. That's why she got dangerous. I hope he plays it tough. I'll enjoy breaking him down. I think I'll be getting along. When you get that book, burn the thing. What do you think we're going to do? Frame it? Okay. I'll beat it then. So long, Lieutenant. Don't forget to polish the badge. All right, now, Eden, you can make things easy for yourself. Tell us where the book is. Go fry a couple of dozen eggs. Okay. Babyface, go get the surprise we have for Mr. Eaton. Sure thing. You'll like this, Seamus. You got company. See? Helen. They came, Johnny. They grabbed me. But don't worry. I can't tell them where the book is because you never told me where you hid it. But you're going to tell us where, Eaton. Otherwise, we start on Miss Williams. Oh, don't tell them, Johnny. It doesn't matter about me, but don't tell them. Don't make the mistake of thinking we're bluffing about working the girl over, Eaton. We're not. You know how much that book means. Yeah. Okay, I'll give it to oh, you. Johnny! Where is it? You wouldn't find it yourself. I'll have to come with you. Where to? My apartment. It's not in your apartment. We looked. That's right. But my car is outside the apartment. And that's where it is. Hmm. 
What are you fiddling with the petrol cap for? Because that's where it is. In the tank. Well, aren't you the ingenious boy? What are you doing? I'm trying to get it out. The necks of these tanks are narrow. Come on, hurry it up. If you want it, you'll have to let me get it out. Okay. There it is. Give it to me. Well, that's in the right hands at last. Let's go. Back to my car. You got it? Right here. You gotta burn it now? Burn it? <laughs> Don't be a dope, Tony. But Jorgensen said... Jorgensen. That dumb cop. Why, this book is the best insurance we've got. If any of them feel like getting difficult, all we've got to do is remind them of the pages in here. Yeah. I didn't think of that. Where to now? I'm going back to the club. That's what you think. Oh! He's got oh, the gun! That's right, duck help! <laughs> okay, sweetheart. You can get up off the car floor now. I think on my boat. Johnny! You shot both of them and knocked out Walt. Well, I had the advantage of surprise. Plus the 38 they didn't think I had. I didn't think you had it either. Where did you get it from? Out of my petrol tank. I got it out while I was bending over for the book. And it's the finest fuel my tanks ever held. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Dick. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I've got the book. I'll hold it till you and your boys get here. See you. Everything's all right, Johnny. Couldn't be better. That was a pal of mine in the FBI. They'll be here in the morning to handle the whole thing. I'd have thought you'd take a holiday and not come to the office today. Oh, I'm expecting a client. I called him. He should be here now. And here he is, right on cue. Let him in, Helen. All right. Uh, Mr. Eaton asked me to come here this morning. In here, Mr. Stokes. Ah, I hope you have good news for me, Mr. Eaton. Well, I've had some success. I found what Hank Williams had. That's first-rate work, Mr. Eaton. Oh, what is it? A little book full of names. People connected with the Blues Club and its activities. Splendid, splendid. Well, I, uh, I don't wish to appear rude, but time may be vital. If you let me have that book, I'll start some action. I won't keep you long, Mr. Stokes. You know, I've been thinking a lot about Hank, the way he was, the way he felt, especially about crime and criminals. He hated them. He was a kind of crusader in his own way, an honest crusader. Uh, yes, I'm sure he was. Hank was so honest that he'd never forget to note down a client in my absence. But what do you know, Mr. Stokes? I couldn't find a word about you. I don't see... I salute Chili, now chilled for good. She was subtle when she wanted to be. She sold me the idea that Hank had a client, then provided the client. She sent you along, Stokes, all cut and dry. So that if I did find the little book, I'd probably turn it straight over to you and save everyone a lot of bother. Confound you, Eaton. I'm not going to stop you going, Stokes, because the FBI boys are on the job, and you won't get far. Confound you. Well, that client didn't stay long, did he? No, honey, and we're not staying any longer either. Shut up the office, we're through. Tomorrow morning, I hand over the book to the FBI, and then I start concentrating on my next assignment. And what is your next assignment? You, baby. You. This is Carter Brown. I can't help it. I always like it when the hero wins, which is why my heroes mostly do. But... The hero of my next book, Sinner You Slay Me, finds a lot of complications to cope with before he does. It's a story of a mouse meeting murder, and the mouse is my hero, Marcus Mouse. He's one character whose answer to the question, are you a man or a mouse, is both. So this is Carter Brown saying, so long for now, be seeing you. <laughs> The Lady Was Lethal, you heard our star James Condon as Johnny Eaton. The Carter Brown Mystery Theatre, based on the best-selling novels by Carter Brown, is dramatised and directed by Maurice Travers for Grace Gibson Radio Productions. <laughs>